Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy. I invite you to join me as we explore what it looks like to choose joy in the messy middle while embracing the inspiration, intention, and action that you can take to find joy in your every day. This is your host, Paula Jenkins. Welcome to episode 291 here on Jumpstart Your Joy. This week on the show, I'm really delighted to be doing one of my summer fun series where we're going to be looking back at the conversation that I had with John McEwen of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, where he is one of the most celebrated and best known banjo players in the world. And he's had such a long and exciting career in music. It was really a delight to speak to him about his book, The Life I've Picked, his early days at the magic shop in Disneyland, and about being the first American musical group to tour Russia in 1977. And I'm also really excited because he reached out and he has a couple of new songs that he's just released and he asked if I might want to play them on the podcast. And of course I do because it fits in so well with the Summer Fun series. So Before we get to this interview, a couple of really interesting things that I'm delighted to share with you over the next few months. The first being is that the book that I wrote back in February, Jumpstart Your Joy, Heart-Centered Ways to Find Joy in the Messy Middle, is going to be part of the Tiny Book Course Book Fair which is hosted by Alex Franzen and Lindsay Smith, and that will be in mid-August. You'll be able to hear some of the authors that wrote books reading part of their book, including me. And just like those old scholastic book fairs that we all love so much, you'll be able to maybe find a few new titles that you love. So link for that will be in the episode notes for this. And then the other thing that I'm so excited to announce is that I will be speaking at She Podcasts Live 2021, which will be in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I'm really beyond delighted because I get to talk about some of the stuff that I wrote about in the book. I pitched them that idea about how do we reconnect with joy, especially during hard times. And they said, yes. So if you're a podcaster, uh, I would love to see you there. And you can get tickets over at She Podcasts Live. Just search for that. So those are the two big things coming up in my world. And they fit right on in to summer fun. What really stood out to me about this conversation first was the way that he's been dedicated to finding things that he loves to do and that those things also align to the career that he has. I also found it deeply meaningful that he is so excited and delighted about creating things that he shares with other people. You know, whether that's from a magic trick that he learns and he wants to share with someone else or a new song that he's written or a new song that he's learned to play. It's all about that interaction of learning something to share with someone else. I think you're just going to love what he has to say about that. I'm also really delighted that he shared about his experiences while the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band toured Russia back in 1977. And he has so many fun stories that I I know you're going to love this interview. And what you'll hear here is, so for this remixed version of this interview with John McEwen, I will be splicing in the two new songs. And because I want to give proper credit to the musicians and the tracks here, the first one that you will hear is Back in History. It's featuring John McEwen and Leon Russell, and it was recorded just prior to Leon's passing in 2016. They wrote this song together, and it came together over the course of one night, which is always kind of amazing. And the second tune is Hey Joe, and it's John McEwen with the Oak Ridge Boys, which is part of the Nashville Sessions, and that EP has five tracks, and you can find that out now as well. So let's jump right into the show. Welcome to the podcast, John McEwen. Well, thank you. It's good to be talking to someone in my old home turf of of Fremont. (laughs) That's right. We just discovered that you probably live just a few blocks from where I'm sitting right now. So that's really exciting. Yeah, it it was for me in seventh and eighth grade, too. It It was a new development. And we lived there for a couple of years and then moved to Southern California. Yes. I was a kid, you know, so I didn't have much to say about it. Uh, yeah. I was just glad that we were now only a, a two miles from Disneyland. 
Right. <laughs> um, where, I, well, it, where I ended up getting my first job. I want, at 16 years old, I wanted to work in the magic shop in Disneyland. And uh, by the time I convinced them, I was 16 and I got the job along with Steve Martin. We were both trying to get a job there and the best three years of our early, early life of our life, probably. And you guys were still friends having that there at Disneyland? Yeah, it started at Disneyland. And then we were seniors in high school together in Garden Grove High School. And uh, then he went off to do things. He went to four years of of college. I went to two years of college and started a band. Mm -hmm. And the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band got going. And then Steve got going. And my brother managed him as early career his first 15 years his first movies and tv shows and stuff and road dates so it was very strange to have a guy that you've got a job in a magic shop with where you were really excited about making a dollar ten an hour Mm. wow yeah and if you work 50 hours you get a dollar 25 overtime and uh i'm glad to say i got a lot of overtime (laughs) But it's very strange to have a friend such as that for so many years that has now made, like, he's probably worth half a billion dollars. And I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm doing fine. Well, and you have recently, or maybe it's not really United, but I believe that Steve has played on your album. And of course, now he plays the banjo himself. Can you talk a little bit about, can you talk a little bit about that? It must have been kind of a really amazing full circle type moment, too. It really was. It, it, Steve and I started playing the banjo at the same time, two different banjos. And I was able to learn things faster than him, so I showed him what I was learning. Mm-hmm. And he kept up pretty good, and then he started writing his own songs. Now, keep in mind, these are a couple of young guys. This was a, a seven, a 18, 19, 20 years old. Right. And it wasn't until I was 20 that the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band got underway, in which I was the oldest member. Mm-hmm. And uh, the ages were 16 to 20. And uh, then that went by for a few years. Steve kept playing the banjo and started performing live around the area, trying to figure out what to do. Mm-hmm. And let's just fast forward to 2010, when he had written a bunch of tunes, and I said, I ought to produce an album on you. And he said, that's a good idea. And he called it The Crow, New Songs for the Five String Banjo. And it won a Grammy. Aha. Mm-hmm. So I was I was proud of that. Over the years, I've done music for a couple of his specials and played with him several times. And he has written some uh, wonderful forward for my upcoming illustrated book of the Mountain Whippoorwill, which is a poem that I do. Up in the mountains, it's lonesome all the time. I do it while I'm playing fiddle and then pick up the banjo. And uh, he wrote a forward for it because we start, we learned that in high school, mm-hmm. senior year, and uh, been with us all our, all our lives. It's a seven-minute poem with music behind it. I have an illustrated adult children's book coming out next year with the Mountain Whippoorwill. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Maybe, I'll, maybe I'll win something. I don't know. <laughs> dropping all over the world people were dying all the boys and girls things were going wrong in almost every way i said now how could these things be this way back in his story oh somebody killed the leader they blew him right away didn't seem to like those those words he'd say 
catastrophe were happening almost every day. Now I said, now how could this be? It was way back in history. Jerusalem and Lebanon, all the holy land. Grenades and bombs are blowing up every boy and man. Every day, something just seemed to go wrong. I say, how could this be? It was way back in history. So sorry, man. If we don't do this thing, the whole world won't understand how to treat each other. They won't understand. Abel said, how could this be? It was way back in history. Way back. I understand you have another book coming out in 2021, and it's about when the nitty gritty dirt band went to the Soviet Union in 1977. You have a lot of photographs from that time, and some of them haven't even been seen before. 1,700 black and whites and 200 color out of which there's going to be about 150 black and white and maybe 20 color. Mm -hmm. And it tells the story, along with me telling the story, of being the first American band to go to Russia in 1977 (laughs) to do 28 sold-out shows. It was incredible. It was really fun. It seems like you were some of the first, and then things started to open up. Uh, A lot of rock bands, especially, went in after you guys were there. What was it like being in the Soviet Union kind of as a first American group to be there? Well, they didn't know many American groups. Mm -hmm. And the music was illegal. It was illegal to import things that weren't approved. It was illegal to have albums, uh, clothing, anything. It was restricted. You couldn't use Russian money anywhere else in the world but Russia. And it was a three-year jail sentence if you had possession a foreign currency, or if you you could buy a record, you oh that's going to cost me ten dollars. I got to find ten dollars. Hey, this guy over here has ten dollars. Arrest him, you know. And to get it into the country, it was such an arduous thing that they even had Bones records. Now Bones records are something that is a little unusual. Hey Ivan, I go to I go to London next week to get X-ray because they don't have the right x-ray machine in Russia. People were allowed to go get x-rays. And they wouldn't say it, but they knew what he was doing. And he would go get his x-ray, and then he'd take the x-ray film, which is about 14 by 25 or 20, and, you know, it's thick. It was heavy. And Mm -hmm. then they'd record a record on it. They'd put it on a turntable and record on it. And so you'd have a bunch of grooves in it. It's like the records you used to get in the magazine. Right. A paper record or something. Uh-huh. And, uh, and when they'd come back into Russia, they'd bring their x-ray with them. And, and the, 
uh, KGB stupid. Uh, they look at it, they think it's just X-ray, mm-hmm. but his album of the Beatles, you know, or whoever, <laughs> whoever they, whoever they can capture, and it would play maybe twice. Wow! So they were ready to record it with recording machines when they got it over there. This is in the seventies and the and the eighties, and uh, it was quite a quite a thing to have an American music. Voice of America Radio, very important, very much jammed by mm-hmm. the Russians. Radio stations didn't exist. Radio station did exist. One station right. in every town. All the radios in a certain town were tuned to that station. The the Leningrad station, the Moscow station, they were different frequencies and you buy a radio with that frequency, and you'd listen to the radio. You just turn it on, right? And it was, on. and there it was. You didn't have to go looking for it. There is not a station dial, folks. <laughs> and uh, so I always thought of a Russian. I wonder if any Russians defected to New York and went out and bought like eighty radios, just trying. <laughs> so many yeah. stations here. Yeah. You know, but. Uh, that kind of, we signed some albums. I signed a 15-year-old Temptations album and an Aretha Franklin album, I think. Wow. That was t- 10 years old. But uh, it was a great time. It was mm-hmm. like being a combination of the Beatles and Creedence Clearwater and, and, and the, the Dirt Band, you know. Right. <laughs> we, we, we did a Chuck Berry song. We did Georgia on my mind. Took a female singer with us and... and Let's just put it this way. The shows went over so well, playing to two to 5,000 people a night, depending on the venue we were in, that they went over so well that they didn't let anybody else in for eight years. Yeah, rock and roll, the communist plot to overthrow capitalism. No, it's the American plot to overthrow communism. I know there have been some documentaries since then that have arguably stated that allowing American music in was one of those things that brought communism down as it the stood. The people involved in that tour said there were two things that helped bring that wall down and change things. And one was music and one was a fax machine. When the fax machine came online, you could send pages of information in seconds before the, before it got jammed. That's fascinating. I hadn't even thought about the fax machine having an impact, too. Or... 1988 or 89, the fax machine came along. They would get stuff out there. The guy with a fax machine could receive, too, you know. And in looking forward to your book and some of the photos that were of that tour, what are some of the things that people can look forward to and expect in, in the book that you're putting out? They can expect to look at something that was 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it looks about the same now (laughs) (laughs) that they can. It's just a interesting look back at a, at a band when it was at its, at its prime. There have been, had uh, five different primes, Uh, career swings, upswing, downswing, up, down, up, down, up. And uh, after 50 years of doing that, I left to work on my own. Mm-hmm. And to talk about my new stuff and write books about the old stuff. I have a book out called The Life I've Picked. Mm-hmm. The, the Life I've Picked is basically takes me from beginning to uh, right around now. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say to end, but it covers the, the early playing, the dirt band, uh, the what, what, what went on around the, the dirt band, nitty gritty dirt band thing. And the other people that I've played with, which is from Leon Russell to Roy Acuff to just a long list of people. I know in another interview, you mentioned that you thought that the theme of the book or the through line for the stories that you pulled together was that you got to live the dream and you still do, but it doesn't really feel like you're working for a living. Is that kind of how you would still interpret that piece or what it says about your past? Well, I I realized that the magic shop was so much fun Mm. that I used to be sad when I would only get 50 hours in a week. I usually usually got 60 hours, and then I'd get my paycheck, and that was fun too. But it was just the point was it wasn't work. It was doing something I loved. 
Mm-hmm. And as long as you're doing something you love, sure, you've got to make some money. But if you're doing something you love then and you make some money, you might make a lot more than you thought you were going to. Mm-hmm. And that makes it even more fun yeah. to be able to do something that people actually go out to see is really a responsibility. I always feel like there's people in that audience that have put the ticket on their refrigerator of a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, and they're, oh yeah, there's the ticket. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to that show. I hope he does, you know, whatever. That is a real responsibility I have to the audience. And that doesn't matter if you don't feel well or if you're, had trouble at home or somebody's sick or whatever. You're there for their two hours. And I could have a migraine. I used to in the early, early years. Mm-hmm. And doing a show would make it go away. Because you know, it, it's such concentration. That's fascinating. I mean, I hear that in the stories that you just told. I don't know if you want to talk about how you found your way to connect with other people or find a happy way out of a hard place. Well, uh, my purpose is to, I sit at home and, and maybe come up with a new lick and go, oh, I can't wait to get this out, out in front of people, mm-hmm. see if they like it. And, and uh, cause I, I, once I either make it up or whatever, or I learn the song, well, I don't want to sit around and play it for me. I'm pretty bored with that. So I got to go out and do it for somebody and make their life react to it you know yeah. it's like a magic trick aha there's the mm-hmm. old day <laughs> it's a good through line right there I, I learn a magic trick in front of the mirror and i'm doing it all right well what good is a magic trick if you just do it for yourself you're yeah. not going to fool yourself <laughs> <laughs> i know how no. you did that of course i'm me you know yeah. so you got to take that trick out and do it for people and that of trick course. in this case would be a song or a story or a joke or something. Yeah. And about your creative process, it sounds like sometimes things kind of just come to you or how do you go about creating something new, whether it be a book or a song, a melody or something else that you share with others? What is your creative process? How do you, how do you get it going? I have to admit that with COVID thing happening, it is very difficult. I very much appreciate your phone call and your questions because that is more fun than sitting around the house sitting and, and writing something i've been i've come up with maybe two songs but mm. i'm just like anybody else i'm trying to figure out what to do that i would look at a year from now and go oh i'm glad i wasn't just watching binge watching some show Frankie and Grace or something because I already <laughs> did but yeah <laughs> you seen Frankie and Grace yeah I've seen part of it we're currently going through Little House on the Prairie again binge watching has become should be a sport yeah so in between different things it's it's fun to find things that's why I like working on things I have a, an album that's all talk it's almost done it's all um spoken word album that has music behind each piece. One of them is a letter from uh, a guy in the Civil War writing to his wife with it's like film score music behind it. Mm -hmm. Another one, another one is a letter from a guy in Vietnam writing about taking Nui Bon Din. And uh, that's really, that was a tough one to read because this is from a guy in the field. Wow. Uh, anyway, it really came out good. Another one is Fly Trouble, a, a uh, Hank Williams song. You know, Did you ever sit straight up in bed with something circling around your head? You swatted it as it whizzes by, and it's just one pesky little fly. Mm. And uh, that story goes on with music behind it. Yeah. And uh, totally different music. Skin 
that's creamy, dreamy. Eyes that look so lovey dovey. Lips as red as cherry berry wine. Now listen, Joe. I ain't no heel. But old buddy, let me tell you how I feel. Sugar, honey, she's a sugar pie. I'm warning you, I'm gonna try to steal. Introduce that pretty little chick to me. Hey, hey Joe. Joe, quit that waiting, hesitate, let me at her. What's the matter? You're as slow as any old Joe can be. Now come on, Joe, let's make a deal. Let me dance with her to see if she is real. She's the cutest girl I've ever seen. I'm telling you face to face, I mean to steal. like the end, my friend. I've got to have that dolly for my own. Hey, Joe. It sounds like your inspiration, especially during this time of COVID, has been in, has been with things that are maybe different than they were previously, or you spent a lot of your time playing with some new things for you. I have. Yeah. And, uh, I have some, the book, The Life I've Picked, I'm hoping to get out next year as a spoken word book, only one with enhanced spoken word uh, things, music and photos and and uh, some video that you'll be able to access when you download the spoken word book. Mm-hmm. And getting that together is a fun thing to do. And But it's very lonely thinking about yourself and things that you're doing and doing stuff all the time mm-hmm. it's a, a lonely pursuit but it's okay i've been alone alone a lot but it's lonely but it i have these visions of it going out there and getting to somebody getting in their house i'd fly over the country over the years mm-hmm. i've flown over three million miles and sometimes you're going over oh kansas or oklahoma or, and uh, i look down there and i go i wonder how many houses have have a record that I'm on, Nitty Gritty yeah. Dirt Band. You know, the Dirt Band got out there, and pretty good. They got out there pretty good. And some of the other records I played on, like Carolina in the Pines and Wildfire by Michael Martin Murphy. Mm-hmm. And uh, that gets out there. But uh, so I sit here and I make something on my computer or I work on the vocal or something, or and I think, I'm I'm making this for somebody's house. I know Ron, I don't know his last name, but he's in Kansas. Mm-hmm. Ron and his wife, Mara, they're big fans. I know he's going to like it. Okay, I know Ron's going to like it. I know Dave in Arizona's going to like it. You know, yeah. <laughs> a few thousand of those. And uh, then you wonder who you're going to reach. That, uh, so it's fun. It's a fun game. Yeah. I like that. I mean, as a podcaster... I I can relate. It's kind of a lonely thing when I'm creating my own solo episodes and I never know where or who these words will ever reach. So I can relate to all of that in kind of an interesting way. And I'm sure there's other people who work on a craft at home and sometimes in their own way. I mean, we're all such social creatures with everything that yeah. everything was in his garage except what his brother bought, you yeah. know? And he put it in his garage. You don't know. You just yeah. paint because you paint. Yeah. And, uh, but I try to capture something, do something. And I've been very fortunate that I've made things that have gotten out there. 
like my most recent album, Made in Brooklyn. Mm, yes. It was it was uh, Made in Brooklyn. Do, do you have that record? Yes, I like it. Very good. Oh, yeah. Well, it was the best sounding record I've ever played on. came out a couple years ago. Yeah. It has uh, John Carter Cash, Johnny and June Son, yep. um, and uh, Matt Crunch, Sonis, David Amram, Andy Gessling from the group, group Railroad Earth, Steve mm-hmm. Martin plays on the cut, John Cowan, the great bluegrass singer, Martha mm-hmm. Redbone, David Amram. And we had up to 14 people on one one song. And it was Amazing. all recorded all recorded with one microphone. Yeah, not to save money. It was a, <laughs> it's a way they did it. Mm-hmm. And you you run a little bit of the song for the engineer. He'd shift people around out in the studio. You need to be closer. You need to be further. Can Amazing. you move over here? You know? Yeah. It was a, a stereo microphone on a dummy head you couldn't all be on one side of the stereo so he spread it out and it's the best drum sound i've ever had on a recording kevin twig was the incredible drummer and he it was just it amazed me yeah and some of the songs the first song on there brooklyn crossing has uh, five instruments it was one one take well all the songs were one take uh, but we might have taken take two. Yeah. Well, yes. And I know Mr. Bojangles is on that album, which is one of my favorites because my dad used to play it around the house and he does a rather hilarious rendition of it himself. <laughs> but would you tell us what made you put it on that album? The first two verses and Matt Cardsonis does the last two. Uh, he's Brumberg does the first three, actually. There's five. And uh, Bromberg used to play with Jerry Jeff Walker for several years and they would do that song together and david bromberg is the first guy i ever heard do it live mm-hmm. back in 1970 we went to uh, arrange for the dirt band after a show to go to the main point coffee house in pennsylvania to see uh, to see uh, jerry jeff walker and he has that incredible david bromberg playing with him mm-hmm. oh great well we got there after the show and Jerry Jeff was collapsed on the floor in the dressing room. <laughs> he called it a wild turkey night. And Bromberg, Bromberg says, I know the song here and I'll play it. And we were talking about that when we finished Made in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And I looked around and I says, well, does everybody know? Everybody here knows Bojangles, right? What key? How about, how about D? Mm-hmm. And uh, D worked out. And we said, okay, let's record it. David, sing the first verse, then the chorus, and the next two verses, then a chorus, and then Matt will do the last two so you can play that backup and do an instrumental solo. And and then, and I'll look at everybody when it's, if they're going to solo. First solo will be the clarinet, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's what we did. Okay, let's roll. And that's what was fun about this album. That's incredible because it does kind of capture that there's there's a liveliness to it. And you don't always get that on an album, right? No. I, I liked recording in the process of making a, a record with a band. But it's so old school. I remember one time the Dirt Band was making an album. And, Bobby, you leaving town? Oh, yeah, I'll be back Tuesday, though. I've got to do the bass over on the second song. And i got to sing a harmony part on another song. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I'll see you when you get back. You know, the record was made, and then one guy would go in and do a guitar part, and another guy would go in and do a, a vocal part. Right. You know, uh, why don't we all know the song and record it at the same time and be done with it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This this album was recorded in two days. Two long days, I will say, but everybody was into it. And uh, that's made in Brooklyn. It was on mm-hmm. Chesky Records. Chesky Records is a fine label. Yeah. I called my friend at Skywalker Sound. I said, "Hey, Bob, he works works there twenty. He's been there twenty five years. Yeah, I'm making I'm making an album for Chesky Records. You ever heard of him?" He said, "John, there's only two things you need to say to Mr. Chesky. Uh, what's that?" He goes, "Thank you, sir, and yes, sir." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. I, I, I use Chesky Records here in. At Skywalker to check my system to make mm-hmm. sure it it sounds right and uh, and he does. That's amazing. They're great sounding records. 
And, yeah. it, and it won the Americana Award from the Independent Record Manufacturers. It is really good. So I'll link up to that one in the show notes for people if they're curious. And if they're curious about hearing it, because it really does have a special sound, and I really enjoyed it. She Dark the Sun is on that. And I had John Cowan, who's my favorite singer. I've known him since 1974. For 10 years, I've been trying to get him to record this song on one of his albums. I called him up to see if he's available for this. He goes, you want me to sing that song? I said, yes. And he did it. And he sang on a couple other things. He did a great job. And yeah. uh, Martha Redbone did a great job. We wrote a music for Martha and I wrote music for a song called I Rose Up. And those are words from William Blake, the uh, British poet from the 1800s. Right. Now it's as if William Blake had moved to Appalachia and learned to play the banjo or fiddle. And that's the kind of music we put behind it. Right. And, uh, it's really fun. Boy, when that was over, it was like we wanted to start it again. Do you have any plans to get back together with them and do some more work? Well, last year, the year before, uh, one or two or three would show up at a gig and we'd do stuff together. But there's no plans right now. You yeah. know, I'm going to go out and play solo or with just John Cable, a previous Dirt Band member. Mm -hmm. And I did a show last weekend. It was Les Thompson, me and John Cable. Les Thompson was is the original dirt band bass player. John Cable was there when we went, when we went to Russia, and then there's me, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a fun thing to do. Yeah. And Matt Cartsonis is is the fourth member of the group I call String Wizards, and uh, no plans right now, yeah. other than some tentative jobs February, you know, maybe uh, February, maybe March. But uh, we have to see how this plays out. So and my wife and I had been together for since February 8th of last, uh, of early in this year, longer than any other time in our marriage. And uh, fortunately, it's worked out. Yeah, it's been interesting. I think for many people within so with such close proximity and for such a long time with the same people, it's definitely been interesting. People like to think, I believe, that they are doing something important or they have an importance to the world or life. Mm -hmm. And this has changed all that. You don't mm -hmm. need to go do that because you can't. Your right. job is shut down or you're, nobody's doing that or nobody, you know. But I think what's happening, is, at least for me, I'm realizing how important some things are that I hadn't paid attention to. Yeah. Like, I don't know how it is for you, but hey, the 7-Eleven, hey, how you doing? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. I'm glad you're here. Uh, the people at the grocery store, the people that put stuff in bags, uh, yeah. um, Uber drivers, you know, just a long list of things that I'm really glad work well in this country. Yeah. Right. I'm finding it to be really nice to be able to interact with our neighbors more. I mean, we've always been friendly with the people that live on both sides, but it really is one of those true points of connections. We can walk out and actually speak with them and we see them face to face. And, you know, I don't even see my parents that often. And so there's this real community here that I think has grown or changed a little bit. Yeah. And also, I think people are finding, oh, I just don't have to go there. I'll mm -hmm. stay here and work. I'm going to sit around the house and I got a book to read. Like, I went to the post office today. It was like, wow, I'm getting out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I got done shipping two packages or three and like, I'm going to go home. That made yeah. me happy. It, it makes me happy to get on the internet and, and see some old friends there and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But what makes me happiest is performing for people. And I look forward to getting around to where I can make other people happy so they can do that for me. Well, yeah, it's been a real treat to have you on the show. Would you like to share where people can find out about your book or about your album? 
uh, before I get to a last question that I like that I like to ask everyone. Yeah, sure. Uh, my book's available on Amazon, The Life I've Picked, A Banjo Player's Nitty Gritty Journey. And uh, it's doing quite well. Read the reviews, all of them, including the one star. It was written by, I'm sure, one of the guy's ex-wives. <laughs> <laughs> but she's disagreed with uh, by everybody, the other over 100 people that gave it five stars. Yeah. So. I'm very proud of the book. I spent a lot of years writing it. The pictures are cool. The pictures with everyone from Jose Feliciano and as a teenager and then 10 years ago playing with him in New York. Amazing. Not a teenager. Leon Russell, <laughs> uh, all kinds of people. Yeah. Willie Nelson. I got a picture in there of Gary Hart and me. Mm. And that was, it's a funny story it was it's a very strange book it sure helped me i know that and then for the last question what are three ways that you can think of to jumpstart joy in your life in the world or in other people's lives i think making some kids laugh and i'd say just be a good grandfather and i've got seven grandkids Hmm. my granddaughter 27 year old 26 year old granddaughter just had a baby so now i have a great grandchild and that is amazing he is so happy yeah he doesn't uh, i think joy is the only word he knows and uh it's a happy baby you know Mm -hmm. and and my granddaughter said "Uh, grandpa uh, you aren't mad that i'm pregnant are you i says well i'm glad you're married and I'm glad you're pregnant, and I'm really glad you're doing something for me that nobody has ever done. <laughs> What's that? What's that, Grandpa? I says, well, up, and now, up until now, I was just Grandpa. Now mm-hmm. I'll be great, Grandpa. <laughs> You've made me great. Thank Aww. you. That made her laugh, and that was fun. She's a sweet girl. Well, for me, it's just musically. I have some pieces that take people away in a good way. And I think that that does it. And I like to continue doing that yeah. and hope that they hope they hear it because it's awful hard to get heard out there nowadays. Mm. Sometimes it's just hard to get, get coverage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, just give things a chance, I guess is the word. Not mm-hmm. just me, but anyone go out and experience some things if you've never been to a rodeo go to one (laughs) you might find out you like it if you've never been to a comedy club go to one you know if you do all these things involve going out i am not going to eat escargot escargot (laughs) and not eating oysters so but every every many other things are open Thank you so much for being on the show, John. It's been a really, it's been a real delight to have you. Thank you so much for tuning in this week to Jumpstart Your Joy. And John, thank you so much for being on the show and for sharing this new music with us. It's so fun to get to hear new tracks from someone, um, from artists that we know and recognize. And a special thanks to John's rep, Matt, for reaching out and asking me if I would like to have this music for the show as well. It's always a special treat and it's rare that a podcaster gets to play full songs on their show because of rights and licensing and all of that. If you want to find out more about John and the links and all of that, you can find them at the show notes for this episode and that's jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash episode 291. And while you're there, you could also pick up a copy of my book before it's part of that amazing tiny book book fair uh, in the middle of August. And you could also read it before you go to She Podcast. So that's over at the website as well, jumpstartyourjoy.com. Next week on the show, I'm really excited to continue the fun (laughs) uh, because Andrea Owen will be joining me for a brand new conversation. She is just about to release her new book, Make Some Noise. We got to catch up a little bit and we talk about her book and a lot of other really interesting topics because 
whenever she's on, we always have such a great time. <laughs> so I hope you'll come back next week for that episode. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy.